<laughs> all right. A very good morning to all of you. Um, if we can have one person open in prayer, and then we'll get started. Um, Zelitoli, would you be able to, you know, open with prayer? Yes, Pastor. Let's pray. Father God, we come before your presence in the mighty name of Jesus as we begin our session on the book of John. I pray that Lord you bless uh, our pastor, Deepika. Thank you for restoring her health. Thank you, Lord God, as she teaches the word of God. Lord, I pray for fresh revelation and input also. Give her the grace to teach uh, this morning also. And also, Lord, bless each one of us who, who are in the class. I pray that you open the eyes of our understanding so that we can uh, learn from you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. You continue to guide us till the end, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, we will get started. If you remember, last time we had stopped uh, at John chapter 13, verse 30, uh, because John chapter 13, verse 31 onwards is where you have the teachings of Jesus uh, starting. So uh, chapter 14, 15, 16, all of these chapters, they contain the final teachings of Jesus. Um, now, uh, John, the writer, just summarizes all of these teachings, um, you know, in one place uh, over three chapters. Uh, but I assume that Jesus probably would have, you know, taught these things over a period of maybe three or four weeks. I mean, uh, from the time that he starts revealing to them that he is not going to be there with them much longer. So uh, from that time on, he starts preparing them for what's what's ahead so um, I'm assuming that you know um, these different things that he is talking to them, um, these final instructions that he is giving them, are kind of spaced out uh, over a period of at least maybe two or three weeks. Uh, but of course, we have John uh, summarizing the whole thing over here in chapters 14, 15, and 16. Uh, so if you look at the very last portion of John chapter 13, um, you know verse 31 onwards. Uh, that conversation actually runs into chapter 14 as well. Uh, so it's actually one uh, chunk, you know, all the way from 1331 um, right into chapter 14, uh, where Jesus is saying, I'm going to be going away and I have a new commandment to give you even, you know, before I leave. And then you have the conversation with Peter. Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And uh, then, you know, Jesus assures uh, the disciples that even though he's going away, um, he is going to, uh, to come back and take them and all of that. So it's basically one conversation. Uh, so it's somewhere many um, hundreds of years later that, you know, uh, these uh, gospels were divided into chapters. So this is a modern division into chapters. Um, when John had uh, originally written, he would have just written the entire thing as one uh, single write-up without any divisions. So um, we observe that uh, the chapter division over here is a little abrupt. Uh, so it kind of breaks the conversation. Uh, so when we are looking at it now, uh, let's look at it as one single uh, conversation extending all the way from 1331 right into chapter 14. Um, so uh, if we could have uh, a few people read out verses for us. Uh, so far, you know, a lot of you have been volunteering to read and uh, that's really helpful. Um, so thanks for that. So now uh, if we can have someone read out um, John chapter 13, verses 33 to 35. Uh, let's look at what Jesus says over here. Uh, John 13, 33 to 35. John chapter 13, verses 33 to 35. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by this all will know that you are my disciples, 
if you have love for one another yeah uh, so this is probably not the first time that jesus is saying this uh, because uh, over the last two or three weeks he has been telling them uh, that there are uh, you know um, that he is going to be crucified and they have not really understood what he means when he says that uh, so we get this impression even as we look at all the four gospels that jesus starts talking about his upcoming crucifixion and uh, the disciples are getting concerned about what he is saying so here he is again bringing up this topic and he says to them i will be with you only a little longer uh, and um, uh, the word that is used over here uh, you know the the translation which uh, rosalind read out now that's actually very correct it says little children that's the word that is used it's not just talking about you know uh, grown ups it's little children so he's speaking with great love and he's telling them you see i'm not going to be here much longer and there's something very important that i that i need to tell you and he says a new command i give you love one another uh, now in what way is this a new commandment isn't this something that has been spoken about all the way from old testament times you know especially when the 10 commandments were given um, yahweh tells his people that they must Uh, you know uh, love their neighbor as themselves so this is not really a new command uh, so uh, what's the word that is being used over here in the original greek um, yeah, it's supposed to be the word well okay i don't have the word over here in my notes but it's supposed to indicate um, a newness a freshness so it's not new in the sense it's been being spoken for the first time rather it is new in the sense it's being now given to these disciples in a fresh way in a way that it has not been presented before so the command to love one another has always been there with us with the people of god but now the lord is saying i'm now giving you this command in a new way love one another how in what way are you supposed to love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another up to that time i'm not sure what concept they had in their minds about what love should be like you know when it's enacted uh, there were times when jesus you know uh, speaks about it uh, he talks about the parable of the samaritan so yes they do have an idea of what loving one another involves but now here jesus says you know the new the fresh thing that i am now imparting to you is that as i have loved you so in that manner you must love one another um and if you do that then people will know that you are my disciples that will prove to them that you are very different set apart from the rest of human kind you are people who love in the way that i have loved you now when we think of this verse immediately the thing that comes to our mind is the sacrificial love of christ you know when he um, um uh when he did not think about his own interests but he placed us uh before him uh he he considered our interests and he chose to sacrifice himself on the cross for us so we generally think about jesus christ's love in that sense but now when he spoke these words to them uh to these disciples you know uh, on that day the crucifixion had not yet happened and in fact the disciples had not yet understood the whole concept of crucifixion so when he said those words to them as i have loved you so you must love one another what do you think came to their minds they were not thinking of the cross because the cross had not yet taken place so when he said as i have loved you so you must love what would have come to their mind minds they probably would have thought about a hundred different instances over the previous 3 years you know when they were uh, living with jesus walking with him interacting with him uh, moving from place to place along with him and they would have remembered all this many 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 instances of how he expressed love to them you know uh, maybe uh, at times of discouragement 
you would have been there to encourage them um uh, at times when they were rejoicing he would have laughed with them and rejoiced along with them uh, at times when they were going through pain he would have sat with them probably even wept with them so this was uh, not just a um a theoretical love that jesus is talking about this is something that he literally showed them in action in practice for the last 3 years they have literally been experiencing this love first hand you know even as they interacted with him on a daily basis i mean there was such a privileged uh, you know group of people um uh, today of course we are very much aware of the lord's love and we do experience it but then they literally walked with him uh, you know on a daily basis and so they experienced first hand uh, his love you know in very very practical ways so when he said to them as i have loved you so you must love they clearly understood what that meant it would involve sacrifice it would involve putting the other person's interests before your own you know especially when they are traveling from place to place and they are tired and they are hungry and when they are worn out at that time if when jesus would get up and you know uh, serve them help them minister to them uh, they understood that that is love so now they are being asked to express love to others in that same way because then the world will recognize that oh my these people must be followers of jesus they are living the way he lived they speak the way he speaks when they uh, you know encounter people who are irritating or people um who are sinful uh, people who are downtrodden they speak the way jesus speaks so you know people would see the similarity between jesus and them and they would realize oh my this must be one of his followers and uh, so that commandment has come come down to us today uh, so when we say jesus there may be a lot of people who don't really know what that means they think of it more as a religious term uh, but when we show jesus love in action then they begin to understand through us oh their lord and master must be somebody like that some someone who cares in this particular way so it kind of um, reveals to them who our lord is what kind of a character he has and that compassion and concern that he carries in his heart so uh, it it's very important this command is being given to us in a new and fresh way jesus is saying in the way that you have seen me expressing love in the way that you see my love being uh, described in the gospels i want you to show that same kind of love in when you encounter people in your own situations because then they will realize that these people must be very different from the others around us because they are followers of this jesus okay so it becomes like a um, witnessing a testimony um, so all of us may not be you know have the the gifting of evangelism we all of course share the gospel in our own way we we witness about the lord with people whom we know uh, but this is one powerful way to testify and witness you know because this is us acting out uh, love and compassion in times of need when people really need us to be there and then when they see that they realize oh their lord and master must be something like this so it becomes a very powerful way uh, to uh, witness and testify about our uh, lord so coming uh, from there to the next portion of this conversation um peter says to the lord lord where are you going and jesus says where i am going you cannot follow now but you will but you will follow later so from that wording you know peter understands that jesus is talking about death um um so you know he says lord why can't i follow you now i will lay down my life for you you know in other words he's saying lord if anything anything dangerous is about to happen if your life is a threat i am willing to even fight for you and lay down my life for you um and jesus replies and says will you really lay down your life for me very truly i tell you before the rooster crows you will disown me three times um jesus is not questioning peter's love 
uh, Jesus is just pointing out how weak uh, Peter is in his humanness. On our own, in our own strength, we can never really serve the Lord or honor the Lord. This is something that takes place just through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. This is something that he does inside of us. There are days, you know, when our emotions are running high, uh, we are, um, you know, uh, full of enthusiasm uh, and uh, we, we want to do great things for the Lord. And then there are days when life has been so bad, uh, prayers have been left unanswered for so long and everything seems so dark. And at that time, you know, we may not really have that passion and that enthusiasm. So emotions are good, but we can't live out this Christian walk on emotion alone because there are days when we are up, there are days when we are down. We really need the empowering of the Holy Spirit because he's the one who helps us to walk in the Christian way, like Christ, imitating him. It is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think it is vital, you know, every morning when we get up and we spend time in the Lord's presence to just humble ourselves and admit our dependence on him and say, Lord, this is not something I can do on my own. I mean, I do not know what challenges are going to come my way today. But Lord, I need you to be there. I need you to empower me. I need your enabling, oh Lord. It's only by your grace, your enabling grace, that I'm going to be able to live up to your expectations today uh, you know so um, emotion is good it's good for us to feel enthusiastic and want to do great things for the lord uh, but emotion alone is not enough because feelings come and feelings go but the empowering of the holy spirit is there with us so when we express our dependence on him and and depend on him uh, when we have that attitude he comes you know, he's our paracletos. We'll be looking at that, you know, in the uh, in one of the passages uh, today. Um, so he comes alongside us. Uh, that word paracletos, it talks about someone who comes alongside you, stands next to you, and helps you to do the things that you're supposed to be doing. You can't do it on your own, uh, but he will enable us to do it. So that's the... Um, so over here, Peter has that love for the Lord. He wants to do something for the Lord. But he fails because at that time the Holy Spirit had not yet been, you know, uh, released into the um, inner man of the uh, disciples. Uh, so that would that's something that would only happen once the work of the cross was finished, because then uh, the disciples would be washed by the blood of Jesus, and then they will they will be able to become carriers of the Holy Spirit. So that is not that is not yet taken place. So at this point of time, Peter is trying to operate out of his own strength and his own emotions, and he fails because of that. Uh, so we do not have to, you know, uh, have that disadvantage because we do have the Holy Spirit within us. And if we choose to continue renewing our minds every day, if we continue to maintain that close relationship and intimacy with the Lord, He will come alongside us be our paracletos and help us to you know um, live up to his expectations and uh, so after saying this rather negative thing to peter you know uh, you think that you're going to stand up for me but you know what you're actually going to be betraying me very soon after that jesus immediately says do not let your hearts be troubled. You know, all these things that I have been saying to you about how I'm going to be here only for a little while longer and that, I, uh, that I'm going to be lifted up. These are all very troubling things that I'm saying to you. And, you know, these disciples had sacrificed everything to uh, become followers of Jesus. They uh, traveled from town to town with him. I mean, of course, they all had, um, you know, uh, jobs, means of livelihood with which they supported themselves, but they could not do much because they spent a lot of time uh, traveling with him. They had become full-time ministers. So at, on many occasions, probably they were just, you know, living on um, the charity of others. People would contribute to them, and so their needs would be met for a few weeks. Um, they were living in that way. And now Jesus is going on talking to them about leaving and so they are very troubled and so he says to them 
do not let your hearts be troubled um and he says you believe in god believe also in me in the same way why because um he goes on to talk about uh, verses 2 and 3 if we could have someone read out for us john chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 please John fourteen two and three. If there were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Yes, uh, and I'm assuming that you read out from the uh, NKJV. where it talks about mansions uh, but then in most of our you know nkjv bibles now we will have that small um, what do you call that citation the footnote footnote indicator over there uh, and down at the bottom you know at the bottom of the page it tries to explain that it's not really talking about a mansion but that word over there the greek word mone is actually talking about a dwelling place all right so um, there's this uh, wrong um, concept that has come down the years uh, where this this uh, idea that you know each person is going to have one uh, golden mansion or something out there in heaven and um, it's a rather isolated way to live i mean you living in your own house and you know your brother and sister living in their own separate mansions um, uh, so that's just because of the translation you know that this kind of a misconception has come in that word mone the greek word over there it's just talking about that word literally means dwelling place which is why niv what it does is it tries to you know use a different word it tries to use the word room um so um if you're taking that niv version uh, it would it would read as my father's house has many rooms and it and he says i am going there to prepare a place for you um and he says i will come back and take you to be with me okay so um this would have made much sense um to the uh, disciples uh, because of the culture that they were living in so uh, in verse 2 when it says my father's house uh, the greek word used over there is oikos okay so an oikos is literally a house it's like this um, you know construction made of brick and mud and all of that so that's that's basically you know i cost and an i cost would obviously have many many rooms and um, uh, so uh, if a man has got let us say 10 sons you know each of the sons is going to get married and uh, so when they bring in their bride you know they'll add extra rooms um, and uh, and if if it's not possible to go on <laughs> extending the i cost then maybe you know somewhere very close uh, nearby they would build another extension so um you you don't really have independent houses you have a large family units um, all living together with many 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 rooms so jesus is actually conveying that kind of a picture here and he's saying don't worry my father's house has many rooms there's going to be enough place for all of you i am going to go over there prepare a place for each one of you specifically and i'm going to come back and take you there to be with me so you're not going to be separated from me because you see there's a there's a bond that has developed between jesus and these disciples over the 3 years they've struggled together gone through so many uh, you know victories and triumphs together they've experienced miracles together there's so much that has gone on and so Uh, for them it's so painful to think that they're going to be separated from jesus and so he says i'm going to take you with me uh, so that you also may be where i am okay so it is it is in that sense that jesus is speaking um uh, so uh, now this is not to shatter anyone's hopes of having a large mansion um it's just that you know i mean would you prefer to be in a separate mansion by yourself or literally be under god the father's roof i mean like literally be in his oikos not in your own separate oikos but in his oikos because you see this is spiritual um, amazing truth that jesus is bringing out over here outsiders are not placed inside your oikos they don't build a room for you if you know if you're an outsider if you're literally a son or a daughter 
then those rooms are built for you that place is prepared for you because you're part of the family they'll not make you go and live somewhere else in a separate house i mean today in our modern uh, you know uh, world that we live in we have this nuclear family units so people you know they go their separate ways and they live in um, you know, one one person lives in one neighborhood and another person maybe lives in another neighborhood but in those days in their culture you know the families would stay together it's like large joint families um so the honor that is being given over here you're not going to be sent to some other oikos you know like as if you're a stepchild you're part of the family you're a son or a daughter and so a place is going to be prepared for you right there in that home in that household so the lord is saying over here you are my brothers so don't worry i'm going to come back i'm going to prepare a place for you i'm going to come back i'm going to take you there and you're going to be with me you're not going to be separated from me you'll literally be with me and that's going to be the most beautiful thing about heaven where we are where we are literally going to be with him the way the disciples got to be with him you know back then we will have that same wonderful experience we will not be in some separate place you know placed over there like some uh, temporary guests but we are going to be part of god's royal family i mean it's such an amazing uh, privilege that is being granted to us completely free i mean we don't do anything to earn it we just place our faith in the lord jesus and the work that he has done on the cross and he freely imparts this privilege uh, to us um so um moving on from there um let's look at some, maybe some uh, scriptures that talk about the um holy spirit that uh, jesus is going to send so the first word of comfort that he gives them is that uh, he is going away but he will prepare a place for them and come back to take them so that they can be with him but while they are still over here they're not going to be left alone they're not going to be orphans you know that's the that's what he actually says in verse 18 john 14 verse 18 he says i will not leave you as orphans so he says i will come to you but he will come to them in a different form um uh, in the sense uh, through the person of the holy spirit so maybe we can have someone read out for us john chapter 14 verses 15 to 18 john 14 15 to 18 please if you love me keep my commandments and i will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you i will not leave you orphans i will come to you in you yes, so again this is another word of comfort that jesus is giving to them he say uh, you know this advocate that i'm uh, going to be sending um he's already living with you that's what he says in verse 17 so the holy spirit was with them but he was not in them you know so um the lord is comforting them and saying he will literally be in you a part of you so you will never really be separated from me uh so um in that sense he's giving them this assurance and um, you know um you guys are in the third year yeah so you know you would have done this in detail you know you you know what those greek terms are which are used over there for another advocate uh, that's the greek word allos um so uh, if i were to say you know give me another uh, i can use two words i can say give me allos or i can say give me heteros if i'm saying give me allos i'm saying give me another one of the same type on the other hand if i'm saying give me heteros i'm saying give me another one of a of a different type it's like you know if like if if we are talking fruits um i have an apple with me and i say to you uh give me uh, allos i'm basically saying to you you know i'm holding an apple in my hand i want you to give me uh, allos another one similar similar kind so you would hand over another apple to me the two apples are apples both of them have the same character so jesus is saying in no way are you going to be losing me this uh, advocate that i'm sending to you is going to be exactly like me allos the same as me the same loving guiding um, you know uh, wise helpful um, person that you have known all this time 
so he so that is the promise that he is making over here um you know uh, just for to give you a scripture uh, matthew 624 you know it's basically where jesus talks about you know two um, how no one can serve two masters so over there that word another when it is used over there in that scripture it says either you will hate the one or or uh, love the heteros so um, uh, allos is something of the same kind heteros on the other hand is something of a different kind and over here the advocate who is being promised to us is going to be someone exactly like jesus uh, so uh, he will uphold the truth uh, just the way jesus uh, did um, you know that's why he's called the spirit of truth and um, he will be righteous uh, he will uh, promote justice uh, he will be an encouragement to us and a strength to us he will be all the things that jesus was back then for those uh, disciples and um, so uh, jesus goes on to say um, yeah maybe we can read out verses 25 to 27 please Fourteen, twenty-five 25 to 27. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. For you have heard me to heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. All right, yeah. So, um, so here Jesus is giving them the assurance that I'm leaving peace with you. Verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you my peace i give to you uh, so this holy spirit who's going to be coming um, to live inside them he's with them now but he's going to be in them and now uh, so he will help us to walk in peace in spite of all the troubles and the trials that are going to come our way uh, so on our own we cannot really have peace uh, when we're in the middle of struggles but because of the Holy Spirit, because He enables us, He reminds us of, of you know, the scriptures, uh, uh, what were those scriptures have to say uh, about how He will be there for us, how He will uphold us, how He will deliver us. Uh, so He will bring scriptures to our mind um, that can comfort us. The Holy Spirit will also just um, impart a kind of divine enabling where we will be able to withstand even the hardest trials. So this peace that we will be able to enjoy, it will come to us through the Holy Spirit. So if you're going through a time of severe trial and you're struggling, and there are days when you feel, you know, how am I going to go on? How am I going to manage? And if you're at that uh, you know, point, um, you can always claim this scripture and say, Lord, this is the promise you made. You said that when the advocate, the Holy Spirit comes, um, uh, he will remind us of everything that has been taught and he will impart peace to us. So, oh Lord, you know, could you through your Holy Spirit strengthen me, comfort me, give me that deep peace and assurance that I need of your presence. So we can ask the Lord for this uh, because, you know, the disciples back then, they would just open their mouths and ask Jesus when they needed help, they would just ask him. Now uh, we are able to do the same thing. We can ask the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, what Jesus used to physically do for the disciples back then, you do that for us because you are in us now. Okay. So in the same way that, the, uh, that Jesus was representing the Father, the Holy Spirit also represents him uh, now in the same way. Um, so let's move quickly into John chapter 15. Um, maybe we can read out, uh, um, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe the first three verses. Yeah. John 15, one, two, three.
John 15, 1 to 3. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruits. You are also clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Amen. Amen. So um, now uh, this is a, um, um, a new teaching that you know John the writer is now um, uh, starting off with. Uh, the previous one was words of comfort. So now there's a uh, there's a new teaching that now he's going to be dwelling upon. Uh, so here, uh, John the writer starts telling us about uh, what Jesus said about the grape wine. Uh, so Jesus starts off by saying, "I am the true wine, and my Father is the wine dresser." So if Jesus is the true wine, what was the fake wine? What was the false? wine you see there's a contrast over here he's saying i'm the true wine what was there before that was a false uh, fake grape wine um and um, here actually jesus is referring to um what israel actually should have been because god planted israel to be like a fruitful grape wine uh, which would you know spread out and be very fruitful and um, make a difference for the entire world. That's basically what God wanted for Israel, first of all, in the beginning. Um, maybe we can have uh, someone read out Psalm 80, uh, verses 8 to 9. Psalm 80, 8 to 9. Psalms 88 and 9. You have brought a wine of, out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and it filled the land. Okay, so the imagery of a grape wine is used over here. That grape wine was suffering and shriveled up and in a very bad condition, almost dying out in Egypt. And then God takes this grape wine. And he brings it to a new land and he plant, he drives out the nations and he plants it over there uh, so that it can take deep root and fill that entire land and flourish. And so now this grape wine of the Lord was supposed to start yielding much fruit. It was supposed to become a, a blessing to all the nations. But what happens? Uh, this is what we see. Um, Isaiah chapter 5 verse 7. So if someone could read out for us, please. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7. For the, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Yeah, so it says, uh, the people of Judah are the wines he delighted in. So this was a grape wine that he planted with great love. And um, uh, he expected much from it. But what was the kind of fruit that this uh, grape wine began to uh, bring out? Bloodshed and oppression and you know um, uh, all kinds of injustice. And that's not the kind of uh, fruit that God looked for. It says he looked for justice. He looked for righteousness. That was the kind of fruit that he wanted this wine to bear. But it did not do that. And so now Jesus says, I am not like this wine. I am the true wine. Out of me will come much fruit. The branches that I am going to bear, you know, all of us believers who become a part of him, this wine is going to bear much fruit. We are going to be disciples who, you know, we are going to be the hands and feet of the Lord, even as we are doing his work over here on the earth. And we will bear fruit, which will um, truly be a blessing to the nations. So in the past, uh, Israel was supposed to be that kind of a wine. 
it failed to do it, to, to perform its role. But now Jesus has become the true vine. And if we, the branches who have chosen to abide in him, if we stay true to him, then we will indeed bear much fruit. What Israel was helpless and failed to do, we will be able to accomplish. We will be a great blessing uh, to all the nations. So uh, this, the, this is the kind of promise that is being made to us because now we are part of the true wine, uh, a wine which is able to help us to bear fruit. So the Lord will do this uh, you know, um, for us. All we need to do is abide in him, stay in him. And uh, so it says in verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. All right. So uh, back then, the Israelite nation, uh, it backslid to such an extent that the 10 northern tribes, after they were taken you know, away into uh, slavery uh, by the Assyrians, they just got mingled with all the um, other people groups. We don't even know what happened to those 10 groups, uh, to, to, to those 10 tribes. It's only later on, you know, when uh, Judah faces its judgment and the Babylonians come and capture them, they come back. They come back to Jerusalem. They maintain their identity. So in fact, we don't even know what happened to those other 10 uh, tribes. You know, they just got mingled up with all the other mm, nations. And they became pagan just like them. Uh, so the Lord is making it very clear. He is not going to put up with branches that are not going to bear fruit. They are going to be removed away. They're going to be taken away just the way those 10 tribes of Israel got taken away. Uh, you know, So he is very clearly saying that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He repeats that once again in verse 6, in case you know uh, the message has not been uh, made very clear. He says that again in verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Because we have a, you know, a wrong teaching that's going around regarding uh, John chapter 15, verse 2. Uh, where you know it says um, they they give a different interpretation for the for that verse. Uh, every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So they say no, no, no. That word um, uh, which is used over there, the Greek word iro, it's it doesn't really mean taking away. It means just lifting up. So he's just going to lift up that branch, give it more sunlight, give it extra care. He's going to make it well. Um, so yes, the Lord does that for His people, but it's talking about branches that have chosen to separate themselves altogether from the Lord because you know we see that in verse 6 um, where it says mm, if anyone does not abide in me he is cast out as a branch and is withered so this branch is no longer even connected to the vine anymore so it starts withering because there is no life-giving sap flowing through it any longer uh, so it's detached itself it has chosen to detach itself from the wine so jesus is talking about such uh, believers who have you know chosen to go back into the world chosen to go back to satan who do not wish to have anything more to do with the lord and so it's not talking about them being lifted up and giving being given more sunlight and more care uh, it's to it's clearly talking about judgment it says that those who do not bear any fruit will be taken away. Why are they not bearing any fruit? That's because they're no longer attached to the vine. You know, as long as the branch is attached to the vine, it will at least be able to bear some fruit. You now we have um, um, Christians who are at different levels in their spiritual growth. We have some very fruitful Christians who are bearing much fruit, being such a blessing to so many and bringing so many into the kingdom. And then there are those who are still uh, growing, developing. But there's some kind of fruit. As long as you're attached to the vine, as long as you're attached to Jesus and you're abiding in him, there will be at least some daily evidence of fruit, you know, in the way that you interact with your family, in the values that you have, the priorities that you, you know, uh, choose to prioritize when you're making your choices. At least there's some fruit which shows up in the 
in the lifestyle that you live on a daily basis because you are attached to the wine and uh, his life is you know flowing into you so you you are being cleansed by his word you are learning from him and so there is always some fruit but if someone is not bearing any fruit they should maybe ask themselves this question did i ever really become a true believer did i just say a salvation prayer when that uh, you know uh, sermon was being preached did i get all emotional and shed some tears and say a salvation prayer and just uh, was it just words or was there a commitment inside my heart where i said i'm going to turn my back on sin and from now on i'm going to follow this lord and master jesus christ did i make that commitment was it a true commitment because if you are a believer you will bear at least some fruit but if you look at your life and you see absolutely no fruit if you don't see any righteousness or holiness if you see only a deep love and longing for the things of the world and no desire at all for the things of god if you are in that state maybe you should ask yourself did i ever really become a true believer and if that is the case you know no harm done you can quickly get down on your knees and say lord i understand what a wretched condition i am in please lord i want to come into your family i want to be joined to the wine so you know you can always repent and come to him uh, so the branches which are bearing fruit what does he do with them he prunes them that word that is used over there the greek word over there it can either mean uh, uh, pruning in the sense of something being cut uh, it can also mean uh, cleansing okay so he prunes us in two ways things which need to be removed from our lives he may cut it off even though you know we want to hold on to those things or he may choose to cleanse us which is why the very next sentence it says you are already clean because of the word which i have spoken to you uh, so even as we uh, live according to his word even as we choose to submit to his word and and follow it um we we get cleansed uh, we we are we are uh, separated from the things of the world so in that sense uh, you know we get cleaned on a daily basis and there are sometimes when it's an actual pruning in the other sense where something gets chopped off um, aspects of our life that the lord you know things will interfere with our uh, spiritual growth he may actually uh, cut those things off and it may be very painful and we say lord why have you taken away these things from me uh, but you know um, somewhere down the line uh, a few years later you will realize that even though the lord deprived you of that thing it was good because you were able to grow you were able to draw closer to him something good came out of it so pruning is always good it is always done not to destroy the branch not to harm the branch it is just done to make that branch more fruitful so that we will not be like those 10 tribes of israel you know so that we will instead be like juda which came back repented um rebuilt the temple and you know they had a future so uh, the lord only wants to you know do good for us and with that intent he prunes us uh, so um verse 4 the lord says uh, abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me so the lord makes it very clear this is something that has to be done on a continuous basis uh, abiding is not a one time thing it's not just something that you do you know once in a while on uh, when you go to church abiding is a continuous process you know when you basically look at a, a grape wine a creeper you don't see the branches running around all over the place right i mean they stay attached to the main wine continuously it's a continuous process continually they stay attached continually the the, the life giving sap keeps flowing from the main uh, you know um, stem into the into the various branches so abiding is a continuous process we can't be people who are uh, you know uh, go to church on sunday and confess and repent and then the rest of the week we we backslide and we go back into the world that is not abiding at all i mean if we are in that state we will really not bear fruit so fruit bearing is something that happens even as you stay in him deepen that relationship with him 
get to know him more and more uh, even uh, as you grow in him and and your faith level in him increases because now you know him even more as that happens as the process goes on fruit starts developing you start changing people can see the difference in you uh, on the other hand if you're a sunday christian and you know uh, the rest of the week you keep going away from the lord that is not abiding at all so if you abide in him on a continual basis he says i too will be abiding in you so he will continue imparting his divine enabling grace to us if we choose to uh, abide in him then we start becoming christ like okay so uh, it's talking about a continuous process of abiding so yeah we'll take we'll go for a break and then uh, when we come back we'll continue thank you <laughs> 